Welcome everyone, Quastini here with a discussion about Total War Pharaoh Dynasties. In this video, I want to cover some of the best beginner campaigns in the game. So these are campaigns that are going to be useful as a learning experience if you're just starting new with the game. Now, there's a number of factors that do play a role in this. Unit variety, because it is important for players to have to deal with a number of unit varieties, starting position. You do want a starting position that does offer some level of challenge, but it's not a ridiculous level of challenge because there are certainly campaigns like that looking at you, Agamemnon. Economic potential, diplomatic potential, legitimacy potential, and so on and so forth. One of the things I do recommend that you do when you are starting a campaign is you customize at least one thing, and that is unlocking all of the features of the campaign from the very beginning. So anyway, with all of that being said, at number five, it is going to be Amon Mess. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I think Amon Mess is a great starting campaign for people to really learn how to play the game. Number one, he is in a relatively safe position. Yes, he does have some desert factions over here. You might want to disable the sea people invasions. But even if you have to deal with those sea people's invasion, let's consider the situation you start with. You have territory in two different provinces over here that are ripe for the taking. Some territory is ruined over here, but there's a lot of resources over here that you can play around with. Amon Mess may have flat out best economy in the entire game. He starts with a good amount of gold, he has a good amount of food, he has bronze and stone available in the desert. Wood may be an issue, but you can always trade uh, f uh, for that with other factions, and you're not necessarily going to need as much wood. Like, stone is actually far more important than wood. That is one of the first tangible benefits that you do have in an Almond Mess campaign. That, the, that economic potential that you do have available over here will uh, give you several more options than other factions may have. On top of that, because you are the Viceroy of Kush, you do get an income of gold over here and you start with a significant amount of gold. That's gold that I have over here? Yeah, that's um, that's his starting gold. That's the baseline starting gold. So it is kind of ridiculous what you have over here. I would recommend recruiting in general over here to start uh, building up that province and then just yeah, going over here for certain territories and starting to recruit troops as quickly as possible. One of the downsides in Amon Mess's campaign is the fact that you are, fo are a faction focused on two things, archers and spearmen. That does limit your potential in quite a few ways. It's one of the main reasons I didn't give an Amon Mess an S tier in the faction tier list, because you might say, oh, you don't need um, melee units. But here's the thing about that. What is better, a faction that has good range units and spearmen, or a faction that has good range units, spearmen, good infantry, chariots, cavalry? Yeah, as simple as that. That is why some factions are better than, than others. But as a starting off point, you will certainly get a lot of mileage out of this particular campaign. Especially since they added Memnon in this campaign uh, uh, early on over here as a kind of natural ally for you to work with. Or conquer if you so desire. I mean, you do both start at war with the same uh, faction, so if you do want to, ac if you do want to go for that, it can be done. And holy moly, are there are a lot, <laughs> a lot of units. Um, to really work with over here. <laughs> Seriously, this is this is an absurd level of units that you can gain over here from this uh, particular campaign. But yeah, being able to get the full stack on a baseline difficulty level, that is certainly power. You also get plus 10% gold from structures. And one of the things I would recommend is going for a god dedication slot as well. In terms of local deities, you do start worshipping a moon who gives you influence in a province, which is actually going to be quite useful because may, much of the territory that you do have over here may not necessarily have the influence you want. So just keep that in mind, be aware of what you're actually dealing with, what you're actually playing with in this particular campaign, and you will do quite well. What's also great about this campaign is that because you're so far away from the capital of Egypt, you are going to have to fight a civil war. And 
you will have to deal with certain opponents. Now, to be fair, like the game makes, uh, like the trailers of this game made like a big deal, like, oh, I'm and Miss and Tostra really hate each other. Tostra is one of your natural allies in this campaign, and that is not a freaking joke in any way, shape, or form. We can really make things work diplomatically with Tostra and make her a strong ally. Steal Seti's wife away from him. Don't play Seti, by the way. Like, a lot of people apparently have jumped into a Seti campaign and they have regretted it. Yeah, if you're looking for an Egyptian campaign to just jump into, this is the one I would highly recommend uh, as a starting point for your particular campaign. Solid enough unit roster to get the job done, especially with the addition of lethality, but you are going to lack some options that other factions do have, and it can be a bit too safe, so if you're looking at, quote-unquote, a challenge, or a campaign situation where you are at actual risk, this is not necessarily the one for you, but there is value in having a safe starting position for a new player so that they can, you know, get their feet on the ground and figure out the various game systems. And number four, it is the Chimerians with their massive horse army. So the benefit of this particular faction is that you can recruit cavalry from turn one, and it is pretty good cavalry. You get horse archers, you get uh, shock cavalry over here with Chimerian warriors. And on top of that, you're not just focused on one particular unit because you do have regular archers, you do have spearmen that are pretty decent at the job, and you do have access to a whole bunch of other units as well over here if we look at the unit roster, so club and shield infantry, that kind of stuff. So that is one of the tangible benefits over here. You will be playing with, other, with more units than just infantry on the field of battle, and that does force you to learn how to play battles in a very different way than virtually every other faction in the game. That is a very, very tangible benefit that shouldn't be ignored over here. You do have the downside of not starting with a royal tradition from the very beginning, even if you have features unlocked, because you do need to go into Mesopotamia itself properly in order to access their tradition. But you do start with a whole bunch of resources, food and gold, and you do have a bunch of factions over here that you can get along with and make various deals that will certainly benefit you and get the resources that you need, things like stone, things like bronze. Bronze in particular is going to be a major shortcoming in this campaign because the first bronze location that you can get access to is over here in the initial uh, enemy faction territory. So you are going to have to deal with that, you're going to have to deal with a siege early on, you're going to have field battles, you're going to have some very powerful opponents, including Assyria, to deal with from the very early portion of your campaign. And it is going to force you to make some choices in terms of economy, because you don't start with the massive economic potential that someone like Common Mess does have, for instance. So you're going to have to make do with some more limited resources, but the power certainly is there. And once you get the ball rolling, you are almost nigh on unstoppable. But it is certainly a very different playstyle because you do have access to a whole bunch of units, especially native units, once you go to go get the ball rolling in a series. So you have things like infantry, chariots, etc. But really, just that focus on cavalry while having access to all kinds of units is what makes it work from my perspective in this particular campaign. You don't necessarily need to go to war with this area, though it is probably going to be inevitable. This faction, the way I describe them, they're kind of like proto-Huns, really. In fact, you could genuinely say in some ways that the Huns may have been descended from these guys. It's kind of difficult, really. Uh, but regardless, it is a weird name of, of a faction. Lullaby. <laughs> Lulubai, but still, I mean, just call your faction leader Conan the Barbarian and, yeah, just get to town, you know, drive your enemies before you, crush them in battle, and hear the lamentations of the of their women. Or rather, crush your foes, drive them before you, and hear the lamentations of the women, however that quote worked. So, yes, you do have, in some ways, a trickier start, certainly a lot trickier than OMS, but you do have a huge arsenal at your disposal and this campaign will force you to learn how to use that. Keep in mind that one shortcoming of cavalry is that they're limited in minor settlements and siege battles so how you tackle them be it continuously besieging settlements or using all kinds of trickery to win there that is certainly a good learning experience from my perspective. 
obviously it's a minor faction, so it's not going to be as good as a major faction, but some minor factions are really solid enough in their in their own way. There are better minor factions, don't get me wrong on this, but here's the thing about those minor factions. For the most part, they have such a cakewalk of a campaign. Like, if you're playing something like Assyria, you will decimate everyone in your path, to be sure. And there are benefits in that in dealing with the situation of Assyria, don't get me wrong on that. But a lot of the minor factions like Manepta, for instance, or Ajax or Achilles, they just obliterate everyone that's in their path and they're just lacking campaign features. Here you are going to obliterate everyone in your path, but you still got to be careful, especially with the resource shortage when we're talking about bronze. And number three, it would be Assyria or Assur, as it is called over here in the game. Now... This is certainly a faction where you can steamroll the map, though keep in mind there are plenty of factions that do dislike you for one reason or another, like, you know, Babylon doesn't particularly guess. like you in many ways, you. nor do some of the factions to the east. But what's great about this campaign is, yes, it is a steamroll faction, it is a campaign where you dominate your oh, foes and just drive them before you, but here's the thing. Here's a nice, real, a really nice, solid benefit of this campaign. You do have a varied unit roster. You do start with cavalry recruitment, not horse archer cavalry, but still, and infantry recruitment. You start with every single resource type available from the very beginning of your campaign: gold, stone, food, and yes, even wood, because your docks, some of your docks at the very least, will provide that wood. You start with a tier four capital, which you can turn from turn one into tier five capital. So you do have a very Where strong start over here, but it is deceptively strong. Keep in mind, the AI does what like to declare war on major factions. So even though many of the factions don't necessarily outright hate you, at least that's what the game is telling you, you can understand that you're in a kind of vulnerable state over here in a series, certainly going through some issues at this particular point in time so how you manage to keep everything together while potentially being attacked on all sides is really going to be a test of your skill to some degree but really the value of this campaign is because you start with everything units resources uh, king position you have the opportunity to really improve your skill as a player as you're dealing with virtually every single mechanic in the game. Every resource, every kind of unit, so cavalry, infantry, archers, it is all available. You also start with more territory than pretty much anyone else. And it's not like some other situations where you may start with a lot of territory, but that doesn't matter because a lot of it is safe. No, you're smack dab in the middle of Mesopotamia, surrounded by everyone that's just going to want a piece of the pie that is Assyria. So you got to be careful about that. You got to be mindful of diplomacy. You got to be mindful of your neighbors. You can't trust anyone. Though you do certainly have the power to succeed if you play your cards correctly. So, you know, you play the court correctly. You do start with two court positions. You start with a lot of legitimacy. You could potentially prevent a civil war from happening. This is a kind of high payoff campaign where you have all of the tools needed to dominate the map, but it can also go very badly, very, very quickly if you do screw up. So useful learning tool might be a bit much for beginner players, but there is certainly a risk involved in this that you don't have with the Chimerians in the sense like they have a resource issue and they have the issue of having to be limited in some ways by the cavalry. Whereas you don't have a resource issue or you know, roster issue, you're just at war with everyone potentially around you. So how you manage that is going to be important. Starting as a king certainly has its own benefits. I would have potentially added Shupul Yuma in this um, situation. But the thing about Shupul Yuma, why decide to add the Syria as it, even though it's a minor faction as opposed to Shupul Yuma? Shupal Yuma's playstyle is kind of focused just purely on infantry because nothing is as good as infantry for Hati. Whereas for Assyria, you do have choices. Infantry, archers, cav, even chariots are all available over here uh, one way or another. And that is really the crucial point over here. How you manage all of this, that is going to really test your skill as a player. Be warned, it might be a bit too much if you're a completely new player, but it can be useful as a learning experience, all the same. 
And number two, it would be Ursu of Kanan. Now, Kanan has a whole bunch of benefits. They have varied unit roster of heavy or medium to heavy infantry that are pretty good line holders in terms of native units. They have chariots, they have ranged units. So you do have that diversity in terms of units. So that's great. And obviously you're gonna gain more diversity if you're playing one of the major factions as Ursu than you would with a minor faction. So that's one of the benefits that you do have with Ursu, even if his start is a bit limited because yeah, you only start with the minor settlement and you are at war with Damascus. Well, I guess enjoy learning how to deal with sieges. It's not a pleasant experience, really. Like, sieges in Total War, I think Creative Assembly really needs to ask themselves how they're going to make them work. But regardless of that, that the variety in terms of unit recruitment is certainly one of the benefits in terms of playing an Ursu campaign. On top of that, in terms of variety, Ursu benefits significantly, be it in prosperity or in a collapse, because... His commands are focused on either a passive effect in terms of increasing our income from raiding and sacking settlements, or you can use your armies to lower civilization state by 50 points, so you can lead to a collapse, lead to a crisis. This might be one of the few campaigns where playing with the Sea Peoples enabled might be worth it, maybe. But if you really want to push that whole crisis collapse thing, this is really one of the campaigns where you can make it work because Ersu, again, benefits from that. I mean, you could arg argue about the Sea People factions as well, but personally, I think Ersu just beats the crap out of them, regardless of that. So you have the variety of unit roster, you have the variety of play styles in terms of like prosperity versus crisis, which was one of the main selling features of this game and didn't quite end up working. But on top of that, one of the tangible, very tangible benefits playing as any Canaanite faction, but especially as Ursu, is you can go for any of the royal traditions on the, on the map. Now, if you're playing a minor faction, you will not have the ability of paying for it, but Ursu and Bay can pay for it. I just think Ursu is the much better faction than Bay. So you want to go for Mesopotamia, you have that choice. You want to go for the Hittite lands, you have that choice. You want to go for Egypt, you have that choice. Hell, you even want to go for the Aegean, you have that choice. It is that kind of flexibility in a campaign that very few other campaigns have that really sells this particular campaign. I do feel that some of the newer factions are better than the older factions. I don't think they update the older factions at all. I mean, obviously, you know, additional like lethality and a couple of other things have made an impact. But all the same, there are still tangible benefits when you're talking about playing in this campaign. You want to become pharaoh of Egypt and rule for the greatest prosperity of mankind while you're laughing about it because Ursa finds the entire situation hilarious? Absolutely. So this is what sells this campaign. This is why it's a great learning tool because, again, variety of units, variety of possibilities in a campaign more so than bay because bay you know y you might think like oh bay starts close enough right so you should have technically the same possibilities not quite because you are exposed as bay in a way that ursu is not you are in a safe starting position and that gives you the freedom flexibility in a campaign to basically do whatever you want so there are tons of options that you can go for in this campaign that you just don't oh, have in other campaigns that's why i would recommend it is one of the first campaigns that I finished in this game in the old version and my sentiments on that have stayed the same even with the addition of new campaigns that this is a really good campaign for a variety in point of fact this is probably the only campaign that has benefited from all the changes that they've made well Shupal Yuma is also benefiting from the terrain changes but you know, having access to Mesopotamia all of, all of a sudden and the cavalry that's there. Imagine Ursu with cavalry. Jeez, this guy was a powerhouse before the addition of cavalry. Give him cavalry for native units that are in Mesopotamia. Yeah, I don't think you can stop this guy. So, there are certainly a lot of possibilities. You might have to work for it early on, but once you get the ball rolling, you ain't stopping. And that is the glory of Ursu. I've compared this guy to kind of like the Grimgore. Like, he's the closest character that you could compare to, say, Grimgore from Warhammer 3. And he does hold up. At number one, it would be King Priam of Troy. So, on one hand, you do start as king with all of the benefits that come 
from that. So the power of the crown, the court positions, two court Speak positions, and one of them vacant, though in this case I gave it to Lycia. And let's just kick Agamemnon out of the court over here, because why not, right? And maybe give it to Achilles, because I think we can have a better diplomatic relation with Achilles than obviously we would Agamemnon. So you do have that unlocked from the very beginning. On top of that, you also have not just one general to deal with, but you also have Hector, you have Paris, and you have Aeneas. And if we look at the ruling family, we do have all of these characters available. Hector's icon over here, by the way, does absolutely need to be fixed, but all the same. You do have a family that you do start with, all of the, some of the princes of Troy, uh, some of the sons that Priam did start with. So you do have a bunch of children available for marriage, to become generals, to become potential heirs. So you do have that particular mechanic to manage in a way that other factions don't from the very beginning of their campaigns. So that's already another benefit. But on top of that, the reason this campaign wins out is, Great yes, you do start with free regions, free food regions, and you do have a stone region that you can get relatively easy access to. But at the same time, unlike, say, Assyria, you don't have the same kind of resources from the very beginning. And this is fine because it forces the player to understand that they're going to have to go out there and get those resources, be it through diplomacy or through conquering territory. You are very strong as a faction, and you're actually relatively safe in your starting position. You, you're not going to be fighting everyone from turn one, done. so you do have that bit of a safety net from the beginning of your campaign in a way that other factions do certainly lack. Now, another reason I would recommend Troy as for a beginner player, though, keep in mind it may take some doing getting used to all of these features and you might be overwhelmed, so be, bear that in mind. But what's great about Troy is that you have all kinds of units available at your disposal. So, for instance, things like chariots, archers, really good infantry, some of the best Goodness archers rise. in the game, if not then the best archers rise. in the game, good slingers. And so, effectively, you're dealing with all kinds of units in this campaign. Now, you don't have cavalry, but you do have chariots to make up for that. So having nice good infantry, team. having good yeah. archers, having those options from the very beginning of your campaign does lend itself to a really good learning experience. Because again, you're in a relatively safe starting position, but you do need to go out there and capture those resources I'm because otherwise you're obviously going to run out of them. Bronze, gold, stone, etc. So it is obviously a concern that you are going to have to deal with if you are playing this particular campaign. And that is the reason I recommend it. Lots of choices, lots of variety, lots of opportunities, be it to the west, to the south, to the east, and even to the north in Frace, to the element ex extent that Frace is available in the game at the moment. So all those kinds of options that are available in this campaign with a pretty powerful and varied unit roster that very few other factions can match. You do start worshipping Apollo, which is not really the best initial god to go for. But at the same time, you can certainly make it work in a huge number of ways. So as a learning experience and any difficulty, this is really a campaign I would highly recommend as a starting experience. That is all. Questine signing out. If you have any other ideas or maybe feel some of these factions should be placed differently on Your this list, do let me know. I'll see you next time.